What is going on, Restoration Dominators? Hope you guys are having an amazing day. I've got an amazing interview for you today. But listen, before we jump in and kind of give you all of the goods about what this interview is all about, I want to give a big, huge shout out to our platinum sponsor, starting with Brittany Alexander, better known as Lawyer Brit from our very own Legal Corner with her very own episode each and every single month, which by the way, if you haven't checked it out yet, make sure that you check that out. Uh, Lawyer Britt's going to be answering some of the latest questions when it comes down to uh, changes in, you know, when it comes down to the law, when it comes down to legislation, statutes that may affect you and your business, as well as sharing some amazing case studies moving forward. So big shout out to Lawyer Britt uh, for being one of our platinum sponsors, as well as our next platinum sponsor, which is our very own Carlos Machine, the claims machine from Policy Holder Advocates, which is also joining us once a month, every single month with his public adjusting corner where he shares with us not only case studies, but uh, some changes that are happening with the insurance arena, things to look out for with the changes in policy, how restoration contractors and public adjusters can go ahead and work together to maximize claims and have an overall happier customer. So big shout out to policy holder advocates and callers machine, the claims machine. Also big shout out to CNR magazine. If you haven't gotten your subscription to CNR magazine, make sure that you go ahead and uh, go to cnrmagazine.com. Big red button, upper right hand corner of the screen, hit the big red subscribe button, get your issue today. And of course, company cam, but as per usual, we will go ahead and talk about them a little bit more later on. This episode was fire. I had such an amazing time. We are joined today by, with uh, Brandon Donatelli, which is the chief revenue officer over at Homie. So we get such, we, we talk about so many things. We talk about entrepreneurial mindset, all the keys that an entrepreneur in today's day and age need to have from a mindset perspective on how to really be successful, how to be nimble, how to move forward and really move the needle financially in today's day and age. We also talk about marketing, sales, strategic partnerships. Uh, we talk about closing, so much great, amazing information. But more importantly, we also talk about what Homie is all about and how they are currently disrupting the industry. And more importantly, how this presents an amazing opportunity for you, the restoration contractor, to be part of that network and hopefully increase your revenue as well. So this is an amazing episode. I think that you guys are going to get so much value that I hope that you really enjoy. So without further ado, let's jump into the podcast with Brandon Donatelli with Homie. Let's go. Welcome to the Restoration Domination Podcast, where you learn actionable advice that moves the needle and helps service-based businesses dominate. Here's your host, Rico Garcia Jr., what is going on, Restoration Dominators? I'm really excited because I think going on, man, it's going to go almost on a year. I've been trying to get this gentleman on the podcast and we just keep missing each other. So this is going to be a fun one. We're going to be covering a tremendous amount of information. Brandon, welcome to Restoration Domination. Are you ready to help us dominate? Let's do this, Rico. It's been a year, really, that long already? I, it's it's getting close. Well, then again, I have a bad perception of time, so it could have been like, you know, a month ago for all I know. <laughs> my my timelines are always skewed. But yeah, it's it's been a while. Ever since Captiva at the uh, Violand um, event, big shout out to uh, Violand. Yeah, we started uh, talking about possibly getting you on the uh, podcast, and then here we are. We finally made it happen. So do me a favor. For those few people out there that are watching and listening to the podcast, maybe they're not familiar with the name, let the world know exactly who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. First, Rico, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And my uh, my my right hand man here, Anthony Rosello. We're we're excited to be here. Love what you're doing. Love your show. But uh, for those that don't know me, and I think there's probably quite a few out there that are not sure who I am or what I do. Brandon Donatelli. I'm the chief revenue officer here for Homie, and uh, you know Homie's a direct repair solution provider for the insurance uh, industry. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more as we go here about what that means and and what we really what we really are and how we fit in the industry and what that looks like. But 
gives you a little insight as to who I am. I think when we met about a year ago, I was in a VP role at CoreLogic. So that's one of the you know, primary places that I think we can talk a little bit about some of those software solutions and a little bit what shapes who I am and where I come from. So a lot of good stuff there. Nice. How did you get into, uh, into this world, right, of insurance billing, insurance, restoration? Like, what, what, what did that journey look like for you? Man, I'm going on 22 years. It's been a minute. But, uh, and he looks, and for, for those of you that are listening to the podcast, like he looks like he's 22. This is like insane. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. It must be that good California lifestyle, you know, South Florida lifestyle, maybe. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm a Chicago native, born and raised, spent most of my time there. Uh, I was in the fire service, you know, 20 some years ago. And, uh, you know, simultaneously running a general contracting business that ultimately turned into a restoration company. I got a little bit of influence when I was in college. I uh, did some time with Allstate and the catastrophe team. Uh, so I was aware of the, insur- you know, the industry. I didn't understand completely how I might fit in one day or, you know, if I was even going to be a part of it. You know, I, I left, went to work in the fire service and, like I said, general contracting. And then, you know, a, a State Farm adjuster later arguing with his laptop on the hood of his truck, convinced that State Farm was trying to push him into retirement, reintroduced me back into the industry. And, you know, very quickly, uh, I did what a lot of people don't do, but I, I got into the restoration industry going 100% fire restoration. So, um, you know, really out of the gates, I took a, you know, a slightly over a million a year part time general contracting business as a firefighter and turned it into a near $10 million a year operation in just a few short years. Um, you know, applying some important, I think, methodologies around understanding sales and operations and, and just really ha- had a really voracious entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, it, it just really focused on that over the years and put a lot of energy into building good relationships and growing the business. Awesome. So talk to us about Homie. What, what exactly is, is Homie? Which, first of all, I told you off camera, absolutely love the name. And I definitely would want to hear, I want the audience to hear about the uh, story about how you actually came up with the name, what it originally was. Uh, but talk to us about what Homie is and who it serves and, and, you know, how that ties into the restoration arena as well. And, you know, all parties that are actually being benefited by the existence of Homie. Yeah, definitely. You know, Homie's about five and a half years old. It's not brand new by any stretch. And uh, back in the day, in the day being, you know, about four years ago, Home Experts was a home warranty kind of property management and specialty uh, repair solution that was, you know, similar to restoration. It was a wrap repair solution uh, provider. Uh, and it was using leveraging technology and Uber-like experience to be able to capture an HVAC, a plumber, an electrician in an emergency scenario very quickly. Uh, the business did very, very well. And, and a couple of years ago uh, at an insure tech conference, a few carriers took an interest in that and uh, you know, really felt that the industry was in need of you know, something more simple, uh, not a full TPA or managed repair network that comes with all the bells and whistles, but something that is just a, a very low complex solution provider. And that's exactly what Homey is today. But we're different. We're not like a managed repair network or TPA. We call ourselves a direct repair solution. We don't charge contractors or restoration providers to be in our network. We don't charge the cost of the repairs. We don't charge a membership fee. Uh, We feel that the center cog of this whole operation is around having healthy vendors that that are uh, motivated to be there. And I think if you want to resolve a low complex claim, there's not a lot of margin in that. So by not charging cost of repair percentage or fees, uh, it's very, uh, it, you know, contractors want to be a part of our network and work with us because of that. So we've got to work with Profile Gorilla very closely. So credentialing and background checks are, are you know, industry standard today. We've got to meet all those security requirements. But, you know, outside of that, you know, we want you, if you want to do more restoration work and you don't necessarily want to be uh, sharing your, your profits uh, to, to the tune of 5 to 6%, um, in, a, in a low complex claim category, we're your, your go-to partner. From a carrier perspective, they have a ton of volume of these low, low complex claims. They need help solving them. They really would prefer to see these go through a restoration channel versus out to just a normal handyman or somebody in the industry that maybe doesn't understand the complexities of restoration. So we think we solved that really well and we're, we're getting a lot of traction in the industry because of that. 
Nice. So uh, a couple of things that I want to talk about, kind of talking off camera, that I think would make an, an amazing theme for this particular podcast. A couple of subjects I want to, want to cover. Number one being the entrepreneurial you know, mindset, especially with the background that you have and you know, how you're bringing that to your current position now. I want to get into the marketing and strategic partnerships. And then we also want to talk a little bit about uh, sales and closing and driving revenue because we were talking about that off camera. And these are all subjects that we could talk about. Like you said for probably a few hours at a clip. So we'll try to do our best to extract as much value as humanly possible. But in your opinion today, knowing, looking at the landscape, right, of what's happening in in construction, what's happening in the restoration arena, what's happening with insurance and TPAs, that's a very polarizing subject for some, right? Um, There's very few people that are in the middle, uh, like, you know, that are like kind of like me, like Switzerland, I'm like, do whatever, whatever works for you. Most people are really passionate on one side or really passionate on the other. Knowing all of these things, what do you think the entrepreneurial mindset needs to be today in order to win in business in restoration? You know, I think the biggest key for me over the years has really, you know, been understanding how to be adaptable, right? A growth mindset isn't fixed. It isn't sitting in one place and just waiting for business to come to you. But it's really being adaptable to market conditions and understanding what's occurring out around you and how to uniquely fit yourself into that environment. And as things change, everything is cyclical. As the markets change, like we're going through one right now, we came out, we're coming out of this blistering growth period. Real estate is already starting to set a little bit. There's finally people are willing to admit we're heading into a recession. And I don't want to be an alarmist of the 08 recession and that, you know, something big and massive, but, you know, a recession's a 10 to 15% adjustment in market, right? So we're going to see a reduction in the amount of real estate transactions taking place. We're going to see, we've already seen market shift. If you're like me, I've watched my portfolio and it's not what it was six months ago. Uh, These things happen. How do we adapt and change? Do we freak out? Do we run around with our hair on fire or do we start making adjustments in the way we operate, start tightening our belt straps a little bit and really looking at, you know, um, how we're going to do business differently as this landscape changes again. Luckily for me, I've been through a few cycles of this in my 22 years, so I, I see how it works. I understand it. One of the things I love about our industry, Rico, we don't really respond and react to all the economic shifts as drastically as everybody does. Insurance and restoration, houses still catch on fire, floods still happen. Hurricanes still come. They don't care about the economy, right? Well, right. to me, this is a great business. It's, it's the only business I want to be in because we tend to really sell smoothly even when the rest of the world is on fire. Uh, and that's our job. It's, you know, no pun intended there, but that's really what we do, right? So I think the biggest factor in entrepreneurial mindset is, is, is being growth focused, right? If you're not growing, you're going backwards. So, you know, I've talked to people over the years that are like, Donatelli, one's enough enough. Never. Like, yeah, right. Like every time we achieve something great, it's just another plateau. It's like climbing Everest. There's these base camps along the way. You've got to stop. You've got to readjust. You got to, you know, at some point you need oxygen and you need other, you know, systems. People fall off. Never, you know, not everyone's going to make it to the top. Right. Leadership can be a very, you know, very lonely place. And when I say that entrepreneurship, you need to be a leader of self first. You need to have a really great concept of understanding you know, where you're headed, so understand your, your key. And we talk a lot about KPIs of business. Those are all trailing metrics. I don't hear enough about OKRs. What are objectives and key results? Uh, and since I've sort of stepped one foot out of the restoration and insurance industry and gone to technology about five years ago, I've really started to learn some other concepts that I think are really valuable to the insurance and restoration industry that, gosh, I wish I knew 15 years ago I'd be even further along today than I am now, right? Um, right. So, again, I'm going to say it one more time. If there's any one thing you can be as an entrepreneur, it's adaptable. Hungry, adaptable, constantly changing, constantly growth-focused, always looking at that horizon and above. Uh, and I think if you have that in you, you have that grit, you're going to succeed. You're going to find a way. So the restoration industry is one of those industries that I find is trailing quite a bit behind 
from most industries, right? Especially when it comes down to the adoption of new technology, the adoption of new ideas, the, the adoption of new marketing and outreach techniques. So leader, you, you were talking about leadership and leadership of, of the self, right? Self leadership. It's very, very difficult. In some cases for most entrepreneurs, to, it's more difficult to lead yourself into getting yourself out of these old habits than it is to lead a massive team, right? And I think that most of this comes from the mindset of, hey, this is what's gotten me so far. I'm finally, quote unquote, a little comfortable. I don't want to fuck this up. So how does one break that cycle, right? Like how does one keep, how do you keep yourself fresh, looking for new opportunities, looking at different verticals, looking at different marketplaces and saying, hey, look, this is working really well over here. How can I integrate that? What kind of mindset do you think is needed in order to keep yourself fresh and nimble and constantly being able to maximize new opportunities? Curiosity, right? We have to have that curiosity of a child. Whenever we get to the point where we think we know it all or we, we've been through it all, we're in trouble, right? So right. That's why I think having a regular cadence of getting out to our industry conferences and spending time there. You know, everybody looks at these events and says, hey, what's the ROI? There isn't always a direct ROI, right? Getting our eyes around new technology, making new relationships, meeting new people, getting different mindsets or mindsets that allow us to continue to be adaptable that takes effort that takes time you know if you're you know i left the restoration industry i got to tell you i didn't do it perfectly i was overweight i my gray hair bald i mean if you saw a picture of me from five years ago and you see me now it's a different world i got 10 years of my life back leaving the restoration industry and stepping out of it to realize i wasn't running a sustainable system for my personal health and life balance you know, right. fell apart. You know, my kids were frustrated. They didn't feel like giving the attention that they needed. And I, and I say these things carefully. Not everybody's willing to admit those things, but the reality is at the end of the day, parts of my life were suffering. I needed to make a change. And I was right. fortunate to leave at the right time. I was fortunate to walk in and take the knowledge and expertise that I've learned over the years and bring them as a subject matter expert to a new software technology company. You guys may have heard of Matterport. Spent some time over there. I worked with some really intelligent people over there and learned a lot. Was able to launch the insurance vertical segment over there, build a great team. Largely today, I, you know, that team is, uh, you know, not there. The company went public and like most companies do, the team kind of splits off and goes into the other directions. But man, I got to tell you, it's, it's exciting when you can look back on your career and understand this is what I've learned. How am I applying that today? And what can I go out and learn more of? and do more of to continue to bring value where I, where I sit. One of the things that you right. touched on briefly that I talk about, and Anthony to my right here can tell you firsthand, it's one thing to talk the talk, but if you actually walk the walk, it's important. So, you know, in software, we wear t-shirts. I'm not, you know, I'm in an executive position. I'm not always gonna be in a collared button down shirt or, you know, dressing to impress. We're, you know, I, we're software and technology, it's like Steve Jobs. We're in jeans and t-shirts as often as possible. You're not going to not buy from me because I'm not wearing a collared shirt. Are you, Rico? Right. Yeah, no, yeah. it doesn't matter. It's like it's what, what, what the tech is going to do for me, it's right? <laughs> but if you talk to Anthony, you talk about our systems and, and really get back to the core of the root of what we're talking about here, you know, marketing and sales and understanding the difference between the two and how they fit in your organization is important. The restoration industry, like we said. So let me, let me just interject here because what you just said is so important. Understanding the difference is really important, but one of the huge missing elements is people not understanding the similarities that exist between the marketing and the sales. And then the fact that these are, it's one system that's operating, that's pushing the whole thing forward, right? So that just like people don't understand the similarities, they don't understand the differences. And it's important to keep your eyes on both sides of that equation. Yeah, right? absolutely. Right. So it, it, and. We reference it through a lot of sales and marketing training that we do as a flywheel. You, you, the wheel doesn't turn if all parts aren't functioning correctly. And if each part doesn't know its job, the wheel's not going to continue to turn you know, succinctly, right? So in this situation, it's critical to understand that. But one of the things that I do in a, in a CRO position is we have to manage the flow and understand the customer journey, understand our funnel. And we flip the funnel into a horizontal fashion out of its traditional vertical 
and we look at a customer journey in a horizontal manner, and we understand that marketing is what opens the funnel. It starts the pipeline. It really identifies our ideal client profiles, helps us understand in restoration business, there's five agents, adjusters, property managers, trades, and then you have your TPA and network business. These are all buckets that drive revenue to your business. And understanding each one has a different cycle time. And they're not necessarily closing a sale because you get repeat business from each one. So it's driving a referral business, right? So understanding mm -hmm. an agent might have five to 10 losses a month, each agent. So to me, it's valuable to go market agents. If they've got monthly opportunity, I'm going to market them more frequently. Adjusters might do $5 million in, in revenue or $5 million in losses a year. They are a great opportunity to go develop a good relationship with adjusters. And who in my organization works most closely with adjusters that I can turn into a salesperson in this operation? It's not necessarily my marketing person. It isn't necessarily my salesperson. But once we do two or three jobs with the same adjuster, if we're not developing a friendship and a relationship with them, we're doing something wrong. And if that adjuster, if every phone call that my estimators and my project managers hang up aren't saying, hey, thank you for that. Is there anything we can help you with? Do you have any other projects or claims that you know we might bring value to? Ask. We talked about that earlier in sales. If everyone in the organization isn't asking for an opportunity, who's going to get one? Yeah. Exactly. Just asking for, you know, take being able to identify the opportunities and then asking on how you can move forward on that opportunity. That's like 90% of the battle, right? Like people sort of go, oh, I'm not making any sales. And typically you go, you know, into their presentation. I'm like, well, what is it that you're talking about? I'm like, oh, well, you know, well, we, we've got a follow up call for next week. I was like, all right. So then you're a professional. So Zig Ziglar talked about this. If, if it, all of any of you old school people, I'm like literally dating myself. By the way, it's going to be my birthday week, turning 41 on Friday. What? Jesus. So, um, well, yeah. So, um, but so, so I'm dating myself here now, right? You know, Zig Ziglar talked about, you know, being a professional salesperson, not being a professional visitor. And a lot of salespeople kind of fall into that trap. It's like they think that just by showing up, you know, shaking your hand, kissing, a baby and then walking away that they're going to earn business. But that, that person that you're visiting has a need. And here's the thing. They may not even have a need that you can service, but you know someone or you can guide them in the right direction. That is an opportunity to win because again, now you're becoming a person of influence. You're becoming a person that's valuable to have to, for them to have in, in their network. Right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things when you talk to Zig Ziglar, I, I, I often look back at there's a formula and an understanding with every good relationship you earn in business, there's three to five transactions that don't yield a return. And it could be a simple transaction that just is like, hey, how are your kids doing? Or last time we talked, your wife was ill. Is she doing better? Because now there's empathy there. There's caring. There's understanding. But those are the things that we do with friends and family. That's what your homie does for you. He's got your back. Right? He knows yeah, what you're exactly. dealing with, what you're going through, and they try. And, you know, that's one of the things I really like to talk about in what we do here is we're here first to bring value to the industry. We make good connections. We try to get problems solved. And if we can do that well, who's not going to do business with us? And if you exactly. run a business or you're a marketing person, I tell people all the time, you better have your internal marketing. You call that culture, you, you know, and, and not just the crap you see up on the wall, but actually walking it out in those times of challenges when you really need to, you know, apply it. And not the fluffy crap we see on social media either, right? We talked about this in our, you know, right. kind of our, our pre-discussion to getting live on, you know, on the podcast here. Real conversation, like having real discussions with people that are that are real, not the fake stuff we see on social media. So. If your internal marketing and your employees and your internal teams feel important and valued, they're going to be the best salespeople in your organization, every single one of them, not just the people you pay specifically to do marketing and sales. Yeah, exactly. And, and creating a real type of culture when it comes down to the, the quote unquote company missions, right? Me, I'm, I'm really weird when it comes down to like company missions because, you know, words on a piece of paper, it's like everybody wants to have them and they're always really fluffy and they, they, they just want to make it sound as heavenly as possible. But there's very, very little substance as to what those words mean, especially when you walk into their offices, right? So how do you take that and internalize it and make it this a, you know, a living organism, if you will, in your organization? Like, what do you think are, would be some of the best steps that a business owner can take to 
really get everybody on their teams. And I'm talking from technician to receptionist to the route marketers to their salespeople to their estimators to really have an understanding of sales, their marketing process, and then also the overall company mission and those you know core values, if you will. You know, I think it's important that core values, you know, culture is is sort of the the vibe, right? And if you have a good culture, you have this tribe mentality. People stick together. They get really excited and become sort of cheerleaders about the organization. And when you do that effectively, you see it. People feel that energy. They enjoy interacting with everyone at the organization from the, the, the you know, lowest person on the chain to the, to the owner, right? One of the things I used to do when I was a consultant is I'd go into an organization. I loved organizations that were at least that step to where they were actually posting their, their values around the office and all around you know, the, the, the property. So you, you know, people were reminded of them. But one of the things I like to do is I kind of like ad lib. If I knew your core values, I'd have a conversation with you. And I would use those core values conversationally with you and fit them into what we talk about. We do it here all the time. We talk about bringing our A game and you know, thinking big and, you know, how we work as a team. Naturally, without being corny about it, not, you know, you know, having, you know, you know, clapping in the morning and, and having these hoorah sessions, which are great for some people, others they don't. It worked for me on the West Coast. If I tried that in Chicago, they would have dragged me out back and beat me, right? <laughs> Where you're at what you do, you got to understand your people. you got to build a culture that people want to be a part of and participate in routinely. And you got to be consistent. And if you can bring those things Man, Rico, I can't tell you, when companies have internal culture that works and resonates and it's hitting on all eight cylinders, people are excited and fired up to go to work every day and do their work. The second thing you have to do is process. Go ahead. Right. So so just, just so that I capture the entirety of the market, or try to anyways, I'm... 100% certain that there's some people that are listening to the podcast right now or watching this and be like, all right, cool. Culture is amazing, but I don't have enough people to create a culture. Like it's like me and the wife, it's like me and my cousin, you know, like where does, where does that start? And, and this is something that I've seen quite a bit with a lot of entrepreneurs, right? They're like, when I have a hundred people or when I have 15 people, then I'm going to start putting this stuff in place. Or should this be common practice today and make this part of your daily uh, ritual, if you will, right? This almost forecasting of the things to come without getting too woo-woo, right? But really internalizing it yourself and kind of going back to the first thing that we said, right? This leadership of self, because if you can't do it with yourself, you probably can't do that with the team of 100. So like when should someone, the small entrepreneur who understands the values, the, the, the person who sees the patterns and every single successful business owner and entrepreneur that I brought into the podcast, it's the exact same thing Small variations, but the exact same pattern. It's the culture. It's the it's the, the strategy. It's the SOPs. It's you know you can pretty much nail it down to around five to ten things that each and every single one of these people do consistently. How do they do that as a smaller organization? Well, you said it. You know, and I think in the question, the answer lied within. Right? Is it starts with self. I I don't need but one person, me, to start with a culture, right? That is, I live by that. I, you, we've, now we've run into each other a couple places. Is it consistent? Do you see the same guy showing up every time? I do with you. You, you know, I haven't met a successful person, Rico, that doesn't have somewhere documented what their goal or strategy for life is. I'm a little bit geeky. I have family values and a mission for my family and what I lead is in, at home. It's on my phone. I often refer to it because I want to make sure I adhere to it. I know it nearly you know, verbatim, but I, I often go back and read the words. And the other thing is, I add to it, I change it, it's adaptable to as my times change. It's a living document, right? That's right. So, you know, as much as we talk about that, some people I think can be a little overboard with it. I think all good things come in spoonfuls and you got to know when to take the medicine and when you need to just allow things to kind of flow naturally. And going back to the beginning of the discussion, how do you get that balance? How do you get yourself out of those environments? You need to do that sometimes. You need to walk away and look at things from a distance and see how it's functioning, how it's operating. Get, get out of people's ways, see who they are. But it's interesting, when you have the right culture and it starts with one, you start to, John Maxwell is another one I follow closely, the law of magnetism and multiplicity. How do we attract the right talent and how do we multiply and expand it? And it starts, if it isn't with the first one, 
we know that everyone after that is going to continue to, you know, like, like cells in the body. It's going to either, you know, uh, continue to divide and, and multiply, and it could be cancer, or it could be really healthy DNA that's going to continue to, to flourish and grow and expand. And, and it happens naturally. We don't need to force it. But you have to know what the goal is, what the objectives are, and what you're looking to accomplish. And if the single person at the helm doesn't know what that goal is, nobody's going to. And we see a lot of people that romanticize the idea of being an entrepreneur. And look, at if it was so easy, everybody would be doing it. And today, in social media, it, I love our millennial generation that's really driving you know, our, our businesses today. But they need direction. This, this, this group of good folks needs some people that understand life and understand the realities of the world and help them understand what culture really is, how to apply it, when to apply it, and when to change it, when to adapt it. I've been at companies. The culture you need to get to a million dollars is very different than the culture to get to 10. Not the same. So as right. a company, if you can't go through the exercise as the owner and the individual first, to understand your own culture and your own strategy to, to you know, walk out your best life and your best business and best entrepreneurship, you're not going to succeed getting five people to do it, let alone 50 or 500. What's the role of coaches and mentors on that journey? Uh, there's a lot of diehard entrepreneurs that look, in fact, they have made it quote unquote on their, on their own, but there was always somebody, you know, that they, they would kind of consult with, right? Uh, before that entrepreneur, for that business owner that is going, that maybe is at a million, they have ambitions to get to 10 or they are at 10, they want to get to 20, 30. Each, every, each and every single one of those stages is different, right? What role do you think that the mentors and or coaches uh, play in that growth, in that success, in highlighting some of the weaknesses or some of the blind spots that they may have? And should people be looking actively for good quality coaches, good quality mentors? Oh my gosh. I find me somebody in the restoration industry that doesn't follow a sports team. We, yeah. we pay athletes and coaches to coach at every level. Because it helps. It's an outside perspective. We need somebody off the field looking at what's happening from, from a distance to really zero in on what is and what isn't working. One of the things that we have to be as entrepreneurs and leaders is we have to be willing to accept constructive criticism and not get knocked down by it, but understand that it fuels our growth and it fuels our ability to continue to succeed and expand. Coaches are invaluable. I've had coaches my entire career. Uh, I've been fortunate to have good, you know, there's coaches and there's mentors. Coaches understand the business, they work in the business, they've got a proven track record in history, and they can help steer you in a good direction. But unless you execute, and unless and nobody knows your business better than the individual, but you still need that outside perspective. Mentorship's a little different. Mentors, maybe somebody that's going to help me on my personal journey. It's going to help me get those that personal culture that I have that I bring to the table and apply every day. They're going to help me build and develop who I am internally as a person so that I can go out and do that. And we need that too. Not everybody's, you know, and you'll hear it often, Rico. People will say, I can't afford a coach or a mentor. Bullshit. Right. You can't afford to lose your business and fail if you are not figuring in. And you don't have to, you know, not all coaching and mentorship costs. You know, this podcast is a form of mentorship and coaching. I hope we're bringing value in the things we're talking about today to individuals that are there. I've got a number of people I talk to that say, hey, we want to talk to you. Just talk to a company that's picked up a new CRM I've got experience with. I gave them a whole new perspective on how they should be using it and how I used it and the success I had with it. I got a call yesterday. They want to get on a 30-minute call to have a little more discussion around it. If anything, right. at the minimum, I know who I am. One of my highest strengths is I'm an energizer. You talk to me. I'm charismatic. I can get you excited and fired up about anything, Right. So I'm right. using that gift out in the world to go out and help build and develop people and, and develop relationships and grow. And it comes back to me in space. I don't get paid for it. I love to do it. And people get a lot out of it. And I see them, you know, succeed and do well. I get the handshakes. You've been at events. You know, it's great to talk to people. There's a lot of good you know, information to share out there. So my last statement on this is we don't have to think that it costs a lot of money to go get a coach or a mentor. Get to those conferences, get out of your bubble, 
Go meet people, talk to people, have good conversations because you're going to get a wealth of information. And then and ask questions. And asking questions and being humble is part of the equation. Like, I think that this applies to most people. It, we've all had a question that we really wanted answered and something just got in the way. We didn't ask it, right? And we're just like, man, I really should have just taken the opportunity. For whatever, I mean, especially as men, I mean, if you've ever been in a car prior to GPS and you were with your wife and she's like, just pull over, just ask somebody. You're like, no, I got this, right? It's like so much easier just to stop for a second and be like, hey, bro, how do I get over here, right? Like, So it's, still, it's weird. The GPS and I still miss the, the offering. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So l lots of stuff, man. So coaching mentorship, uh, obviously, is, is, is an important role. And I've spoken about this quite a bit, right? Uh, again, coaching and mentorship. Look, books, in my opinion, are one of the, the, the fastest and quickest and easiest ways, most affordable ways to really kind of, you know, tap into somebody's knowledge base, right? Um, for those of you that are constantly in the truck, you're like, Rico, I don't have the time to read. Just look, instead of listening to the radio, just listen to audi audible books. If you don't even have time for that, go ahead and hook up with Blinkist, right, which is an app on your phone, you can bang out five books a day with all of the main major bullet points. These are forms of mentorship. This is forms of coaching that you could have access to. The other thing that I want to talk about on this line of questioning here is entrepreneurship, like you said, it's, it's a lonely place, right? Especially once you're playing at a high octave. Sometimes you don't have the ability to speak to your wife, right? Because your wife doesn't really quite get it. Sometimes your brother, your cousin, you know, the, your, your project manager, like the people immediately around you don't quite get where you are, right? Because you're kind of, you are the top of the hill in your inner circle. So masterminds for me are one of those opportunities that kind of fit into the coaching and mentorship type of arenas that really provide a lot of value because now this may give you an opportunity to get into a group of people with you know 5, 10, 15, 20 guys that are operating at a very similar octave that are already ahead of you, people that are trying to catch up, but everybody's got that same goal and that same energy. Um, what's your opinion, if any, when it comes down to the power of having high octave master minds where a group of business individuals get together, exchange ideas, and the fruits from those type of events? They're, they're, they're necessary. Like they are absolutely, they need to be there. And don't make the mistake of thinking you just need to talk to people in restoration. In restoration, we have this, like, we're unique, we're different. No other businesses like ours. We're five businesses in one. It's all bullshit. These are, these are excuses right. we tell ourselves to, to make our problems unique and unsolvable. And that's a fixed mindset, right? To really be adaptable and growth focused, we need to go rub elbows with other people that are that are struggling with similar issues. It might be different if you're you know if you're running a marketing agency versus a restoration company, but I guarantee you, you you, you have employee and staff issues that are very similar, right? And at the end of the day, that's the key. When you own a company and you get to that point where you're, you're playing at that high octave, you're now managing people, and and your role changes again. And, and getting everybody rowing in the same direction, and, you know, and the right seat on the bus, all the different analogies we have, right? That's an easy right. thing to do. And aligning their, their gifts and talents, not what they think they want to be or what they are, but what they really are good at, and getting them motivated and excited about the things they do well and in the right seat to bring the most value to the organization. And then convincing them to, to, to be patient with the process, because once they start winning and succeeding in the right seat in the right, you know, in the bus, now all of a sudden they start getting that success that makes them motivated and happy. But it's so critical to be in a, in a group. Again, that's a form of mentorship or coaching that can come in a group setting that might be a little bit more comfortable, uh, but you gotta do it. If, if like Again, all these things we're talking about, if you don't like these things or resonate with these things, go work for somebody. You're not an entrepreneur, you're not a leader. Right. And that's a tough pill to swallow, right? You're like being true to self. I mean, you know, there's tons of people. They want to be number one. Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this quite a bit. And he's like, you know, hey, look, you know, everybody wants to be like a number one, but sometimes you're a good B or C or D player, right? And that's really where you shine. And that's cool too. Like if you can make a little bit less and have a little bit less stress and have more of this work-life balance and genuinely you are better at the B or the C or the D spot, 
brother, do that. Like, that's what it's about. Because again, like every entrepreneur that's kind of built a business from scratch knows like the lonely nights knows like hell, how am I going to make payroll? And if you haven't had that, then, you know, kudos to you. I mean, stars have really aligned for you. Right. But like as a general rule, everybody's gone through that. So I think it's really uh, interesting to kind of take a look at that. So real quick, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and talk about the marketing, branding and strategic partnerships, not only how you guys are implemented, but uh, implementing that, but how you see other industries and how they should be implementing it, especially particularly in the restoration arena. But before we do that, let's just go ahead and take a quick second to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back. Photo documentation is possibly one of the most important aspects of what it is that we do in the restoration business, not only so that the client knows exactly what's going on, but also so that you can prove your work to insurance companies. One of the best ways that I found to go ahead and document document our projects is by using company cam company cam is an amazing app it has so many features everything from time stamped and gps located photos uh, individual project files unlimited photo storage in app communication with your crew a live stream of all of your projects as the photos are coming in as if it was an instagram feed so from a managerial standpoint company cam can help you there as well but more importantly it gives you the ability to protect your organization while documenting and keeping everything nice and neat. So we've got a really special offer for you. If you go to companycam.com forward slash dominate, not only will you get your 14 day free trial, but you're also going to get the first two months, 50% off. So again, head on over to companycam.com forward slash dominate get the app, and I'm sure you're going to love it. Hey, Dominators, real quick, let me ask you a question. How would you like to increase productivity? How would you like faster claims resolution? And more importantly, how would you like to reduce litigation? Well, this is exactly what Impartial allows you to do. Impartial creates timely, accurate estimates for faster and fair claim settlement. Building upon Matterport's technology, the impartial scope tool extracts the relevant data embedded with pre-mitigation and post-mitigation scans and subsequently renders an exactimate or a similability estimate that can be approved by a carrier without any hesitation. The magic here is that the software helps contractors generate mitigation and repair estimates for more rapid approval from insurance carriers while removing the burdensome administrative process. Each impartial estimate is produced with objective accuracy using immersive 3D imagery and precise physical and geospatial measurements. Impartial, in my opinion, is one of those tools that simply can go ahead and change your business. And with so many features such as impartial tags, timestamp matter tags, the ability to upload JPEG, PNG, ESX, and so much more. Impartial is that software that could genuinely change your business. Make sure that you check them out in the video description below or in the show notes and see for yourself. Hey, Dominators, real quick, let me ask you a question. Have policyholders struggled to come up with your money because it's held with the mortgage company? Or does the percentage of uncollected debt that you collected in 2021 exceed over 2.5%? Or even better, let me ask you this. Do you dread negotiating with your policyholder when it comes time to collect your final payment and deductible? So look, if you answered yes to any of these questions, then you need to check out Surety. You see, Surety is a third-party fund control company. And what they do is they ensure that you get paid faster and more importantly, completely for the hard work that your crews are doing. Surety relieves not only the policyholder, but you of tremendous administrative burden while ensuring the claims process and more importantly, the proceeds flow via ACH to the rightful owner you, the restorer. And here's the best part. For less than the average credit card fee, Surety delivers on numerous fronts. So here's what I want you to do. If you want to learn more about how Surety can help you, I want you to head on over to www.surety.com forward slash dominate and request a free demo today. Now listen, Restoration Domination listeners just like you are going to receive a really cool offer. And here it is. You're going to receive an exclusive offer, which includes free processing for the first insurance claims check and three months of free access within their network. Again, that's surety, S-U-R-E-T-I 
dot com forward slash dominate. Check them out now. All right. So we're back. Where did we leave off? Oh, yeah, that's right. Marketing, branding, strategic partnerships. So let's talk about that. We were kind of talking off camera very lightly about, you know, uh, branding and marketing. Give us your thoughts on that. You know, what what should that look like in, you know, 2022 and moving forward? How are you guys approaching getting your name out there, getting contractors and, you know, to, to, to sign on and everything else that you're doing? Let's let Anthony. This is the... This is- Anthony's like... He's like, hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of the way we're positioning Help Me, uh, what we always call it is that direct repair solution. And that's because ultimately we are providing a software solution for insurance companies. Like Brandon mentioned at the top of our fast track uh, solution for low complexity claims, it's our flagship. And the way we are kind of plugging ourselves into these other companies that might sometimes see us as possible, right? The TPAs, the manager pair networks, and the companies like that, is that we're ultimately fitting ourselves into a niche that they are not currently equipped to fulfill. So that goes hand in hand as well with our future uh, CAT offering. That's going to plug in and assist them as well. It, it, we, we're providing an offering that helps the carrier and also provides value to those who are plugged in with the repair networks. In terms of how we then incorporate sort of our brand and our messaging that kind of circles back to the difference between marketing and sales that brands alluded to earlier in that our marketing and the way that we're approaching getting our message out is that we're recognizing these problems that exist in the industry. The insurance industry is not perfect. Some parts of it are a bit antiquated. Some parts of it need to be updated. We're acknowledging, bringing attention to, and trying to solve these problems. And a lot of our marketing revolves around bringing attention to them identifying what needs to be done. And then if it so happens that homie can solve those problems of acknowledge, well, then all the better. Right, right. What, what methods, you know, of marketing today do you find to be most effective um, to, to kind of, you know, highlight these issues that are happening in the industry, raising quote unquote awareness, but more importantly, driving revenue, right? Because here's, here's the thing we can raise awareness all day. So so in my mind, there's branding. People interchangeably use branding and marketing. Those are two totally, in my opinion, they're two totally different things. They should be different things. Branding is what Coke does or what Nike does at this point. Like if they didn't run an ad for a year, we probably wouldn't notice. We'd still go ahead and put on a pair of Jordans, right? Like that's not going to change. Um, that's again, brand positioning. Whereas marketing, there needs to be a dollar in and there needs to be an, a, you know, a roll as out, you know, return on ad spend out. What does that look like for a tech company like yours? And does that translate the things that you're doing potentially to like our audience, right? The restoration contractor and how they can possibly, you know, look at the landscape of marketing and positioning and take advantage of that from a revenue standpoint. What do you think? So, yeah, I kind of agree with you in the way that you say that branding and marketing are a little bit different, but at the same time, it's so sticky. Like that's why they're always associated together. Because, you know, you're right, um, getting people to be aware of your brand and things like that, you know, running ads, you know, making people organize your logo, it's important stuff, but it's not necessarily going to translate to a dollar value or a conversion. Like, that's obviously what the end goal of this branding stuff is. So, you know, clearly how do we get to that point? So what I, what I say is this, in terms of what is effective and what we do to create marketing tactics that do end up leading conversions, um, Brandon hit it on the head in terms of attending these events. That's one of the key, most important things, making those personal relationships and, you know, establishing yourselves with these people that you're trying to connect with. Primary goal number one. Past that, now you want to start understanding um, who it is you're actually trying to sell to. Who are the decision makers in the types of organizations that you want to target? What are they concerned about? How can you create uh, marketing materials that would interest them? So now you're creating blog posts, social media posts, videos, um, content that appeals to their interests. Now you're acknowledging those problems and those pain points that they see in their everyday lives. Maybe they're researching, you know, how to handle these low complexity claims because it's something that's bothering them. So now that they're looking at your content, they're like, oh, hey, I saw the homie booth at the event uh, that my, you know, senior uh, innovation officer went to, you know, six months ago. He actually mentioned them or he got a card from them. And I'm on their email list. I get an email from them every month. And now I'm starting to make that connection and realize that 
through all these different channels they've approached me, I actually might consider them as a solution. You know, maybe I will finally click that link at the bottom of the email that says, you know, book a discovery call. Or, you know, maybe I will go ahead and, you know, get to the end of that blog post and, you know, get something scheduled. It's about touching them and acknowledging them multiple times through different channels in order to make them make yourself top of mind when it comes time to actually make a buying decision and start, you know, pursuing a real solution. So right. he said a few key things there, Rico. Yeah, I picked up on that, but I'm hoping you can elaborate. <laughs> I don't want to be inappropriate on your podcast, but how do we touch people, right? Yeah. Uh, there's ways to touch people that you, you hit a nerve for them. They have a pain, right? They, they need to solve this pain point. We need to know the persona of the people who are going after. And to put it in restoration terms, I don't market an agent the same way I market an adjuster. They have very different jobs. They have very different pains. They want them solved. If I'm talking to an agent, they worked hard for years to build a book of business of three to 5,000 policyholders potentially. A claim is a, is a huge opportunity to lose that business if it doesn't go well. It's probably the so, fastest way, right? <laughs> yeah. So if I'm marketing and restoration, how can I develop a little content or outreach to go talk to them? How can I use all these awesome tools we have with social media and outreach that speaks to agents? And I can go find the 500 agents in my service territory and set up a route system that allows me to go talk to each one uniquely and talk about their loss ratio, their cancellation you know, rates. Talk about different things that are their language, understand them a little bit, and tell them how our service or your service can help them you know, make sure they're not going to lose that, that hard-earned policyholder's premium, right? That's the agent's language. And adjusters are very different. Adjusters are overworked, underpaid. They keep getting files loaded on, claims added to the pile. They can't keep up. How can I service an adjuster? Can I help write those scopes more effectively? Can I bring better documentation and make their life easier? Can I put white gloves on and handle the policyholder, the, you know, the, the insured better, so that he's not getting unnecessary or she's not getting unnecessary phone calls. And I can have a brief conversation with the adjuster around, our company could provide these services to you. Is that of interest to you? Can I help you with your workload? Now I'm solving a pain point for that person. And I right. understand the volume of business or the value they have. And I hate to put a number to a person. It seems impersonable, but in business, we well, have it is to. what it is. I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> you know, again, we're not doing this as a hobby. I think that we could still smile. We can give each other high fives. But at the end of the day, bub, like I'm tracking everything, right? Yeah. If I'm taking you out to dinner five times and we're up to X amount of dollars and 12 months later, there's, I'm going to be looking at the numbers. Like it is what it is. Like, you know, look, this is the, the fluffy stuff that people don't want to talk about. And this is where like I get where it appears like I just fish with like a club where yeah. it's like, like, look, we, we all have our friends. We all have our family day to day. We don't necessarily look, I mean, we welcome more genuine and real friends, right? But as a general rule of thumb, when you're going about your day to day, you don't want a, you know, a friend to go fishing with at the weekend. Like this is transactional. Like, Hey, look, how can I help you? How can you help me? How can we both have a really good time doing that together? But ultimately it's about driving revenue. If throughout that process, this is a friendship built on business, all the better, right? Absolutely. That's a little rough, but you know, it's but, it is. Listen, <laughs> have conver but, but here, here at the end of the day, Again, it starts with good leadership, right? Right. And I think if the leader of the company gets the team focused and understanding that we're, we are all building professional transactional relationships, right? Those are not, that's not a bad word. That's okay. We're in business. It's expected, right? Right. So at the end of the day, if I'm a salesperson and I continue to invite people out and go, buy, you know, I'm buying drinks and I'm, uh, you know, buying lunches and I'm doing, you know, by the third lunch, the conversation is be, hey, you know, uh, John, you know, uh, Jake from State Farm, we've had three lunches, we're talking business, we're talking personal. I know it isn't easy for you to, you know, send us a project or, you know, do it that way. You maybe have people you have to use or systems or procedures, but tell me how we can do business together. Let me, let me, let me, let me just kind of expand on this and let me tell you what's worked really well for me. And again, mind you, I know that I'm not an angler. It's either I'm not an angler or I'm such a good fucking angler that I'll tell you that I'm angling. It's one or the other. Yeah. My approach is, look, let me tell you why I'm here. I'm here to romance you. That's exactly why we're here. 
And then I go about, hey, let's go ahead and do this lunch. Let's do this. Let's do that. At the end of this, this is really what the goal is. And I don't want you to be confused about that. And I don't know why, but it works for me. (laughs) You know, and I think that there is such a shock factor to it. First of all, it's a pattern disrupt. And from a marketing guy, you can get that. You're like, whoa, because who walks into an office and says, hey, by the way, I'm here to romance you. This is the end goal. Let's go ahead and get to know each other to see if it'll even work. Let's vet each other. Yeah. Who walks into your office and says that? Very, very few people. You have to. Like, if you get that immediately off the top, you're yeah. like, oh, this guy's a little different. He's got a little spunk to him, right? So, yeah. like, again, for those that don't like to play the game but realize the importance of having to play the game, play it that way and see, try it on for size. And I promise you that if you do that, for those of you watching and listening, you're going to get a very, very different response. And you know what? You're going to feel better about yourself. All of a sudden your colors are going to show because now you're not putting on that. Oh, hi Betty. How are you? Oh my God. Yeah. I was just in the area. Here's my little pamphlet. Like you don't want to do any of that. Right? Like, like, and that's, that's where a lot of people start to feel really uncomfortable with those kind of scenarios. Right? Absolutely. And I think that, and I think what you're two things you, you made a point of, I think it's good. There's different styles. I happen to like your style. I'm a little bit your style that, you know, at times. I'm a challenger personality type, so I challenge the status quo. I challenge the way somebody might be doing their job, and I challenge them and also show them how I can make it easier for them to do what they do, right? How can I help you, right? right? Not how you can help me. So it's transactional, but let me help you, and in the process, it's gonna it's gonna help me. But let me do the heavy lifting, and let you know, let me bring you a good solution, right? The second thing is, you know, I think as we look at what we're trying to accomplish, really important. It's okay to fail. It's okay for somebody to say no. Like if we go out and expect that everybody that we're romancing or dating or trying to get that transactional relationship in play in in a good transactional relationship both parties know they're giving in and they're taking something out everybody gets something and everybody's giving something right that's a good healthy transactional relationship and it's business and it's you know we keep it ethical we do it right it works but it's okay if somebody says hey i like having beers with you in lunch but i can't send business your way you know what? I appreciate the honesty. Thank you. And I do enjoy having beers and drinks with you. And I might not have time to do as often. I'd still like to reach back out to you, but it might not be weekly or monthly or, you know, every few months or whatever the cadence has been. But is it okay if I reach out in a few months and see? And, and hey, if you find an opportunity at some point that you think we can do business together, let's go grab lunch and talk about it and see how I can help. That's okay. Like, that's still a win. You need Absolutely. Walk away. It, it honestly is. I would so much rather have that conversation than just get frustrated and blow up six months in, being like, "Where are we at? Why haven't we talked about, you know, <laughs> what's going on?" A fast no, rather than a long, drawn out maybe. I, I I take the first scenario all day long. And I'm I love the chase, right? If you tell me we can't do business, oh, I'm going to find a way we're going to do business, and I might have to go out one hundred percent another angle, or I'll figure it out, but. The no's are my fuel. Tell me I can't do so, something or can't have something and yeah. I'm going to find a way, right? Exactly. So that kind of leads us into sales and closing. Um, There's still a little bit of marketing sprinkled in there because, and this is, I think this is going to be the good bridge getting into the sales and closing. um, Now that we're closing out on the podcast here. Um, The the last piece is that when you do get that no, number one, being really comfortable and really good at what you do is realizing that you can't be everything for everybody, that you're not going to be everybody's cup of tea. That's perfectly cool. The moment that you accept that, the better that it is, the the, the better you're going to feel about yourself, the happier that you're going to go into that next meeting. And that's fine. The other thing is in golden rule in sales, I'm sure that you know this, and you probably tell this to your team is that the sale almost really doesn't even begin until you get that first objection, until you get that first no, until you get that first little, "Mm, I'm not sure yet, right? That's really where the true salesmanship comes in and where marketing falls in here, where a lot of people lose millions of dollars, I would say, in opportunities is once they get that no, they take it at face value and that's the end of the follow-up. And so much money is lost in that process, right? Because they're not following up. So walk me through your idea of sales 
what a salesperson, whether, you know, they're selling tech or if this is an estimator walking into a fire project, what their mindset should be when they walk into a sales style scenario, uh, which again, sales is one of those words that, you know, feels sleazy for some, but we're all selling something to someone at some point. What should the mindset look like? And what it would be your top three pieces of advice when it comes down to closing more sales that are driving more revenue? You know, sometimes it's our, our culture has gotten interesting. Very rarely do I get a flat no, right? But I don't have a signed contract or I'm not getting the project, right? So that makes it a little more challenging to understand why am I not getting the traction? Why is this not moving forward? And number one, you, you can't, you know, turn around and run away with the first objection. What we're really talking about here are objections, right? And I think yep. being well versed in understanding the objections that you face or encounter is critical. And you can have a sort of Campbell's soup kind of templated, you know, objection list of how you answer these objections. Because you ask anybody in any business, you know, the top five objections are 90% of the objections you hear, right? So understanding how to how to deal with those objections, I think, are really critical and important. And again, the personality type needs to really be a solid focus on no means I just haven't gotten enough information to understand how we can do business. So instead of saying, I failed, I didn't close the deal, they said they don't want to do business with me. What I hear when somebody says we can't do business is, I still don't see the value you bring. I still don't understand how you're going to help me. So I continue to find unique ways to help them better understand how we're connected. Now, if you're new in sales and you're trying to sell a product to someone who doesn't have a need, shame on you. Understand your audience, understand their need, and make sure you can solve for it. Because you're going to lose a lot of sales if you're selling something that people don't need, right? <laughs> right. But the big, I think the big answer is objections and no's are your friend. They, they're your opportunity to, to one, polish your, your tactics, polish your delivery or your, your process, understand you got to shut up and listen. People will tell you how to sell to them if you ask good questions. I've learned, it took me to 40, Rico, to figure this out, but I could have all the answers that I thought were right, or I could ask really good questions, and people will answer their own problems. People will tell you how to sell to them. They will tell you exactly what their needs are. So if you're really good at asking good questions and then getting the hell out of the way and shutting your mouth, they will show you, tell you, and give you exactly what you need, including the keys to the, you know, the keys to the kingdom to get it done. And I think that's key for everybody. And then at the end of the day, people don't feel like they were sold something they don't need. They feel like they got exactly what they wanted, what they need, and they will be huge cheerleaders for you. The most valuable thing to a business, and we used to say word of mouth, word of mouth is huge, right? But a happy customer who's had a success story with your your product or your service is a massive win for your company. And it should go get you many more sales or many more wins, you know, that are, are there. And I, and I really like to look at closing sales as wins and losses and make a game of it. You, wanna, you know, how many, game, how many games do you lose in baseball to get to the World Series? There's a lot of failures and loss to get to the World Series, right? So I think if we look at business and gamify it and understand our failures are opportunities to understand how we can continue to polish our weapons and tools and our, and our skills to go out and better position ourselves to be a value and to be a solution that someone needs is going to be key to you know, success. I love it. In the restoration arena, I've, I've personally have seen and noticed that a good chunk of the, uh, let's call them route marketers, you know, which is really, you know, your salespeople, right? Um, don't really have a, an outlined presentation. They haven't really given it a whole lot of thought. They don't have this formula that they follow, much less do they do any kind of role playing so that they can perfect what it is that they're saying and the tone of voice, the cadence, all of, all of what goes into good communication. Do you think that anybody who's doing any kind of sales should, should dedicate the time to really polish a presentation and then practice it and make it their own? Or should they just fly nilly willy and just kind of 
do whatever feels right. You for know, them. we're we're winding down, and I don't want to be too long winded because, as you can tell, I have a propensity to do that. I've, I'm, I'm practicing gravity. <laughs> One of my weaknesses is to is to, to be you know uh, more concise and, and limited in my response, and then you can ask more questions if you want more information. But I like to be thorough. And one of the things we have a major problem in the restoration industry is understanding what sales is and who our salespeople are. If I have a technician sign, getting a customer to sign off on an iPad or an iPhone for the job, that's a transaction and that's a sale. And if I'm not treating my techs as salespeople and paying them appropriately, scratch your head and wonder why they aren't staying with you. Right? Amen. Marketing people who are going out and driving referral business are not salespeople. They're taking your brand, they're going out and they're delivering a marketing message, and they're getting sources to refer business. It is the job of the person who gets the property owner to sign the contract that's your salesperson. And if we start to understand who's in sales and who's in marketing and appropriately name these people what they do, that's critically important. We get biz dev in there that, that causes confusion, right? If you're out drumming up new business, I call that business development. New logos, new referral sources, business development. Marketing, going out, talking to sources. You may be doing more account management. And then when we get to that $5 million and $10 million, you know, place in, in revenue, we need to understand who's a hunter and who's a farmer and who in our operations should be doing those things. And that's what's critically important. And if we continue to forget our technicians and our salespeople that are out there actually getting the contract that drives the real revenue through the door, that's where we have a problem. And I think our industries, the lake is starting to flip. We're starting to understand the value of training and education on those front end technicians and really realize that everything that you're doing in the office and everything that you're painting on the walls and culture and value, if your technicians aren't the best ones Taking all that information and hand delivering on a silver platter to your customer concisely and directly and getting those signatures, you are doing something wrong somewhere and it's not the technician's fault. I love it. And for all the dominators out there, identifying in your organization who the hunters are and who the farmers are is such a good little nugget uh, for you to go ahead and just, you know, put on this new lens and say, hey, who's really who in my organization? And do I have a hunter that I've gotten a farming position and that may not just be the right place for them? That's I love that little nugget of information there. So we're about to wrap up here because, again, we're, there's so much to unpack and it's such a blast uh, but if anybody listening and or watching if they want to go ahead and uh, you know participate uh, be part of the homie family they want to you know get in contact with you where do they go how do they get in contact how do they get more info Anthony so right now we are massively looking to bring on as many contractors as we can get nationwide uh, there is no charge to become a homie and we don't charge that uh, cost of repairs. So you want to be involved with us today as, as we're, uh, you know, really cutting our teeth and getting traction in the industry. Uh, Anthony, where do we want to send them in the website? So you're going to want to go to homie.com. That's H-O-M-E-E.com forward slash dominate. That's homie.com forward slash dominate. Uh, it will take you exactly where you need to go to get in touch with us and uh, consider joining up uh, our network. Awesome. And then, I mean, Brandon, you're such a cool guy. Like people are going to want to like get in contact with you. Like what, where, where can they contact you personally? Like, you know, LinkedIn, is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? Yeah. Like what do you do all My the cool LinkedIn stuff at? profile is the best place to go. I love that little scan code, but obviously on a podcast, I can't give a scan code. So I'll go ahead and I'll leave a, I'll leave your LinkedIn profile in the video description below as well as in the show notes. And for all of my dominators out there, look, um, if you want to go ahead and, you know, maybe bump your business up a little bit, right? You want to do some less complex, but high volume type deal like this. If it sounds right, um, this would be a phenomenal opportunity for you to go ahead and start picking up some additional revenue, picking up some additional action. 
all while being part of an amazing organization. So make sure that you check the link uh, posted in the video description as well as in the show notes below, uh, which is going to be homie.com forward slash dominate. And there's going to be all sorts of tons of information. And on that note, Brandon, man, thank you so much for uh, jumping on the podcast today. Anthony, thank you for all of your input. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your energy. It was a blast having you on the show. And Restoration Domination, remember, as per usual, hustle, hack, and dominate. You've been listening to Restoration Domination, your number one resource for tips, tricks, and hacks to help your business grow. Subscribe to our channel and follow us for more Restoration Domination. And follow our host, at Rico Garcia Jr. on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Till next time, this is Restoration Domination. Hustle, hustle, hack, hack, dominate, dominate.